Hello, welcome back to my channel. This is David, and today I'm coming back to you with the first part of my kind of discussion here of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight by the anonymous poet who wrote this and several other poems. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today about parts one and two, do a little bit of a uh, couple of passages reading out of them, and just kind of discuss a little bit of the key thrust of what's going on. So in part one, this is taking place in King Arthur's court. Uh, They're celebrating, it's the holiday season, and King Arthur says that he'll not eat until somebody performs some sort of a feat. Uh, so that's kind of laying the grounds for all that is going to follow here. Uh, with the entrance of the Green Knight. And I'm sure you probably noticed while reading this, but when describing the Green Knight, there are a lot of repetitions of the word green along the way. Um, it's It actually becomes to the point where you, you're starting to roll your eyes because it's describing each and every part of the night and just describing that as green. Not only the knight, but his horse. Okay, I mean, I get it. He, he's green. He's big. And this guy is a massive dude. Um, that's one thing that you want to take away from it is he comes, he interrupts it. Uh, he's massive. He, he's welcomed with open hospi hospitality from Arthur. And then he lays down this challenge. And the challenge that he lays down is that one person there in King Arthur's court can come up to him and lay one blow upon him with an axe. And then in a year's time, a year and I think a uh, couple of days, because it goes from being around Christmas to around the new year of the following year, um, that the Green Knight will be able to repay it in kind to the knight that does this. And of course, nobody's jumping up to take him up on this challenge. Nobody's leaping out of their seat to say, hey, me, 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 I want to swing this ax at you and let you do the same to me in a little over a year. And so eventually King Arthur is the one who takes up the challenge and he goes to step forth and to uh, do this when all of a sudden Gawain feels something stirring inside of him and he takes the king's place and takes up the challenge. And so he goes and he walks up to the knight and lands a blow and cleanly slices his head off. Now, one might think that would be the ideal situation here. Until the knight is not bothered by this, goes, walks over, picks up his head, and starts talking with his dismembered head. I really hope that the upcoming movie does this justice, because this is this is creepy. This, it should be. It should be a little frightening to have this scene of this massive green knight who's been beheaded going and retrieving his head and saying hey you know a challenge is a challenge you know a promise is a promise come and find me and sir gawain basically says how will i find you i don't know who you are i don't know where you live and the knight tells him to ask for me people will know me and you will find me which is what leads into the crux of the issue that we see Gawain grappling with in the second part of the poem. So here's the, the scene where Gawain cuts off the knight's head and his response to that. The green knight upon ground girds him with care, bows a bit with his head and bears his flesh. His long lovely locks he laid over his crown. Let the naked nape for the need be shown. Gawain grips to his axe and gathers it aloft. The left foot of the floor before him he set, brought it down deftly upon the bare neck. 
that the shock of the sharp blow shivered the bones and cut the flesh cleanly and clove it in twain, that the blade of bright steel bit into the ground, the head was hewn off and fell to the floor. Many found it at their feet as forth it rolled, the blood gushed from the body, bright on the green. Yet fell not the fellow, not, nor faltered a whit, but stoutly he starts forth upon its stiff shanks. And as all stood staring, he stretched forth his hand, laid hold of his head, and heaved it aloft. Then goes to the green steed, grasps the bridle, steps into the stirrup, strides his mount, and his head by his hair and his hands holds, and as steady as he sits in the stately saddle, as he had met with no mishap, nor missing were his head, his bulk about he hailed, that fearsome body that bled. There were many in the court that quailed before all his say was said. So that gives you an, an impression of just how intimidating this was, and just how unlikely and unexpected this sort of result was um, after Gawain lands the blow on the knight. So that leads to part two of the poem. Um, so Gawain's been reminded of the promise as he's leaving, hey, you need to find me uh, in a year and a day, is what he says in there. Um, so Gawain spends some time with King Arthur and his court in the following year and, you know, is getting nervous, getting worried, and eventually he goes to depart and goes off to find where he can discover the location of this green knight and his green castle. Because, of course, it's a green castle. Why wouldn't it be? And he has no idea where he's looking, and everywhere he's going he is running into an issue. No one has heard of this Green Knight. No one has heard of the location that he's looking for. And so he's traveling around and it's getting closer and closer to the point in time where he is supposed to meet to get the blow repaid in kind. And he comes across the castle. And he goes in there and is welcomed openly by the host and his wife. And there's an elderly lady who also helps wait upon him there. And he's welcomed to stay by the Lord and to, to just uh, recover himself. And so Gawain takes him up on it, you know, spends the night there. And then when the, the Lord asks him to stay further... Gawain says, I, I can't, I need to find this place, this person, because I need to meet him in order to uphold my end of a bargain. And the lord of that place says, hey, you're in luck. You're not very far from there. It's going to take you about half a day to get there from here. So why don't you stay here, rest for the next couple days. You've got four days to be there. Why don't you take the next three and rest on up? And uh, when the morning comes, I'll walk you over there. And you'll be there before noon. And that sounds great to Gawain. Of course, yes, let's do that. That's awesome. You know, his, his quest is nearing its end. He sees the, um, the, the, the goal in being able to uphold his end of the bargain. Because while he's not wanting to get that blow repaid in kind, because we all know what's going to happen, he's going to get beheaded and unlike the green knight he's not going to survive it but his knightly honor his chivalric pride his uh, status as one of the knights of king arthur's court would demand that he uphold this promise that he would keep it in spite of the known risk to his life so he's going to have a couple of days to stay there and the king makes a really interesting deal with him. The king says, I'm going to go out and hunt each day. And everything that I bring back as spoils, I will share with you. And you will stay here and you will rest in bed. And you'll be tended and waited upon by my, my folks here in the castle, by my wife. And anything that you earn throughout the day, you must repay to me in kind. And... Gawain, of course, thinks this is a fantastic deal. Why wouldn't... I mean, you're, you're going to get free food out of the bargain. 
and as far as he can tell, he's going to have to repay nothing because he'll be resting and able to just kind of lounge around and recover his wits and gather up his courage and be all nice and healthy after a harrowing journey trying to find where he's going. And so that's where part two ends uh, with Gawain taking up this acceptance of what's going to happen. And so that's halfway point in the poem. Part three is going to kind of give us the events that are happening while he's staying at the castle. And then part four will bring us to his encounter with the Green Knight again. And I hope that you've enjoyed the first two parts so far. Now, there's another little reading that I want to do here and talk a little bit about. Um, there's a part where it's talking about Gawain's shield in part two as he's getting ready to leave. And so I want to just kind of read this passage and talk a little bit about some of the symbolic importance of what's found in here. Then they showed forth the shield that shone all red with a pentacle portrayed in purest gold. About his broad neck by the baldric he cast it that was meet for the man and matched him well. And why the pentangle is proper to that peerless prince, I intend now to tell, though detain me it must. It is a sign by Solomon sagely devised to be a token of truth by its title of old. For it is a figure formed of five points, and each line is linked and locked with the next, forever and ever, and hence it is called in all England, as I hear, the endless knot. And well may he wear it on his worthy arms, forever faithful fivefold and fivefold fashion. Was Gawain good works? as gold unalloyed, devoid of all villainy, with virtues adorned in sight, on shield and coat and view, he bore that emblem bright, and to his word most true, and speech most courteous knight. At first he was faultless in his five senses, nor found ever to fail in his five fingers, and all his fealty was fixed upon the five wounds that Christ got on the cross, as the creed tells, and wherever this man in melee took part, his one thought was of this, past all things else that his force was founded on the five joys that the high queen of heaven had in her child. And therefore, as I find, he fittingly had on the inner part of his shield her image portrayed, that when his look on it lighted, he never lost heart. The fifth of the five fives, followed by this knight, were the benefic beneficience boundless and brotherly love, and pure mind and manners that none might impeach, and compassion most precious, these peerless five were forged and made fast in him, foremost of men. Now all of these five fives were confirmed in this night, and each linked in other, that end there was none, and fixed to five points whose force never failed, nor assembled on all aside, nor asunder either, nor anywhere at an end, but whole and entire. However, the pattern proceeded or played out its course, and so on his shining shield shaped was the knot, royally in red gold against red ghouls. Jewels. Yeah, probably jewels. That is the peerless pentangle, prized of old in lore, now armed as Gawain gay, and bears his lance before, and soberly said good day, he thought forevermore. So there's a lot of symbolism in there with the, the shield and the repetition of the fives. And um, the, the key things to take out of that without doing a, a really in-depth study and digging into everything that it's talking about is that... Uh, this is part of his representation of him being a really um, courteous and upright and honest knight, um, that he abides by faith. He has really strong faith in Jesus and in his mother Mary, uh, and that's why he has Mary on the inside of his shield, so that he sees her and is reminded of uh, not only her uh, virtuous nature and her thoughts towards her son, Jesus, but the wounds that Jesus suffered on behalf of mankind as he hung up there on the cross dying. Um, the five wounds, I believe, would be the, the crown of thorns nailed into his head, each hand, his feet together, and then the spear wound into his side uh, that he suffers while he was hanging up there on the cross. Uh, and so the repetition of the five is a really important thing in hammering home a lot of this connectivity um, and the, the idea that the pentangle is that endless knot. And so it's always going in a continuous, unbroken 
uh, circuit, which helps to visualize that Gawain is uh, leading a life as a person whose word is unbroken, that his uh, he's going to uphold what he says, that what he does is going to be um, fulfilled. And this is important in seeing him as he goes throughout the rest of this poem, as we find with him wandering, uh, feeling lost, but also feeling dismayed once he arrives at that castle at the upcoming idea of what he's going to be facing and some of those emotions that he'll be grappling with as it gets closer and closer to the time when he meets with the Green Knight to get uh, get it repaid in kind to him. So there you have it. The first two parts, a uh, little bit of reading out of each one, a uh, little bit of a discussion on it. Hopefully you've enjoyed this poem so far. If you haven't started it yet, um, you know, there's, there's no major spoils here, spoilers here yet. Uh, you'll have an understanding of where this is going uh, along the path. And if you've already been reading it, hopefully it helped uh, kind of either reemphasize some of what you already read or maybe even shine a little bit of light on something that you might have missed along the way without going uh, too long because there's a lot that we could talk about and go in real depth. Um, but I want to be mindful and keep this nice and short still, at least within reason. So... I've enjoyed reading this. I hope that you will discuss it. I'll have a link to the Discord down below where you can jump in and discuss it with others who are reading this right now. I know there's a lot of folks that are planning on getting this in the back half of the month of June. So um, yeah, thank you for watching and uh, stay tuned for the my part two where I cover parts three and four to come late in June.